Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, and also, thank you for giving me the best slot, which is lunch, right before lunch on the first day. Uh, so thank you for that as well. Uh, we're going to be talking about errors today. Um, for uh, those who don't know me, uh, I work on the Vine web team. Um, Vine is a uh, mobile app where you can watch little six-second videos. Um, we have a bunch of creative camera tools. Uh, it's also a uh, Twitter-owned and operated uh, company. Um, before I was at Vine, I was on the Twitter ads team helping uh, promoted tweets show up in your clients. You're welcome. And uh, I work remotely from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, which is actually just like a, a three-hour drive north from here. And um, a, a keen observer would notice that uh, this is the stock photo that comes with Keynote uh, whenever you're adding a new slide. Um, so this guy, he's nice. He's got uh, two kids. Um, I actually have four kids and a wife, so I'm a little ahead of the game on that. And the reason I bring that up is today is actually my uh, fifth year anniversary with my wife, who is hanging out and back and watching. So thank you for that. I thought I'd just plug that. We're at a JavaScript conference. It's very romantic, I know. Um, but yeah, she's, she's uh, fantastic. And thanks for, for letting me do this. Um, so quickly, just what I'm going to be talking about, um, <clears throat> different classes of errors, how to create them, how to handle them, and um, knowing when the best time to throw is. So, so let's get right into it. Um, classes of errors. You remember this dialogue. Uh, it's, it's almost, the way it's phrased is kind of funny. Like, it's almost kind of regal. Do you wish to debug uh, this undefined object? or I wish it would never happen, or I wish your tools were a little better. Uh, the three different classes of errors we have, um, just like in, in general programming, not just JavaScript, there's syntax, runtime, and logic, at least in, in you know, interpreted languages like JavaScript. Um, syntax errors, um, we'll, we'll, let's step back here. In JavaScript, <coughs> We have another layer of complexity, which is things can happen synchronously and asynchronously. So we have to deal with syntax errors, runtime errors, and logic errors in async and synchronous code. So it's kind of a more complex issue with JavaScript because um, you don't know when things might happen. You might lose your stack. Uh, you might not know exactly you know, where the error is happening, may not be uh, where the stack says uh, the error is happening. Um, so just something to keep in mind with JavaScript. So uh, syntax errors, we're not going to cover too much because you know, they're pretty apparent. Uh, your linter will stop most of them. Uh, the stuff won't compile. Stuff won't even run in the browser without it. So we'll get rid of those. Uh, and logic errors are kind of subjective, right? It's like it's a case-by-case -case basis on whether or not the logic of your program is sound. Uh, but runtime errors, uh, we, can, we can deal a lot with. So let's get into how to create an error. So you have this error uh, constructor, right? Um, and it's actually, it's in the spec. It's ES5 and ES6 spec. Uh, some people, you know, there's a misconception sometimes that it's like a host object that's bundled with browsers. Uh, nope, it's, it's in the language. And you should always be using it for your errors. Um, you still periodically see people throwing strings around their programs, uh, which don't, don't get me wrong, it'll work. You can throw a string. Nothing's going to blow up. But you don't get any context as to what, what's going on. So uh, what, we always, what I'd always tell you to do is always throw uh, newly constructed error objects. And uh, per the spec, you don't actually have to um, use the new keyword. Uh, it'll work without it. Um, and you can just throw errors directly, if you like without having to uh, instantiate a variable. But, uh, and then, like I said, the new operator is optional. Uh, but I always like uh, using the new operator just because it's more explicit. It tells uh, anyone who's reading your code that we're actually instantiating a new object. So if we take a look at the error constructor, it's pretty simple. You just create a new one, and you pass it a message of whatever is going wrong. 
whatever uh, happened that you expected not to happen. Uh, but we also have some non-standardized things you can pass in, like a file name and line number, which um, to, to everyday development doesn't seem super useful. But you can imagine if you're writing, you know, like a CoffeeScript compiler or some kind of transpile to JS, um, you know, you could scan through your code, find all the new error objects being created, and, and kind of do almost like inline source maps to the files that are, are being used. Uh, but like I said, it's non-standard. It's in uh, Firefox only, and they're trying to get it standardized, but uh, standardizing new things on the error object is not a high priority compared to other things that need to be standardized, so maybe a little while till we see that. Uh, we also have a whole lot of uh, spec uh, error subclasses, uh, which a lot of people don't know. You can actually, if, if you start you know, typing these into your console, they'll show up. You can create type errors, syntax errors, eval errors, um, just different kinds of classes to give your, um, your users and, and your programs a little more context in the, the types of errors being created. So when, when you create a new error, you know, why, why do we want to create an error object instead of just throwing strings and telling people what's wrong? Uh, because the error object gives you um, a message and a stack. So here, you don't have to figure out all the code that I just, I just pasted in a bunch of functions that call each other, and the last one throws an error. And you can see down at the bottom, you get this nice stack that says foo one, two, three, four, and then finally five through an error. So you can kind of weed your way through your stack, which is pretty standard. Um, but without instantiating a new error object, you don't get any of that. You just get a message uh, showing up in your console. So if we um, move over to handling errors, um, with this slide, you're probably wondering why you paid to come to this conference, right? This is uh, pretty, pretty standard stuff, a try-catch. Oh, let's say we're looking for a user with ID 1, and um, if it doesn't find it, it's going to throw an error. However, uh, you can also uh, check the types of errors, which can be more beneficial. Unfortunately, JavaScript doesn't have um, you know, something like, if you're familiar with Ruby, you can um, check against specific types of uh, handlers right in the syntax. Here, you actually, in JavaScript, you have to check the type of the instance, which achieves the same effect. However, it's not, uh, the syntactic sugar isn't there, um, but it works. And then a, a lot of people forget about the, uh, the finally. Um, which is optional on a try-catch. Um, finally is actually pretty interesting. <clears throat> no matter what you do, uh, finally will run. So like, if we have a function here called woe, and in the try block, we, tr we return the word crazy, console will still log that uh, in the finally um, uh, block. So if, if you look at the output here, we return crazy in the try block. But the console log, yep, actually sneaked in underneath that. So even when you return from a function, you may not be returning from a function. Just keep that in mind. Um, anyways, just quick aside, pretty, pretty interesting. So on top of all the built-in errors as well as their subclasses, um, you can also create your cu custom errors. Um, and this is actually required for some libraries. How many people have used like Express, JS, and Node? Handful of people, yeah. So um, not, not a lot of people know you can actually uh, create a subclass of errors specifically for Express, and then Express will use uh, extra properties on that to dictate how your program runs. So uh, this, is a, this is an Express error where along with a message we'd also pass in um, a status code. And if you do that, and uh, you create express errors whenever something happens in your program, express will actually use the status that you uh, added uh, to your error object as the uh, response code. So let's say, for example, we looked for a, a user and there was no user found. We could create a new express error and pass in 404 
as the status, and then Express will actually read that and return the 404 header, uh, response header. Um, so pretty interesting. Uh, a lot of uh, different frameworks are starting to move towards uh, these kind of custom errors, especially on the, on the server and node side. So sync errors, you know, synchronous errors are pretty simple, right? Try catch, uh, not too complex. However, async errors are where the real battle is, uh, where it's tough. Um, so on the left, it was the previous, same as the previous screenshot where you, know, you have your nice stack laid out of all the foo calls you get, and you get. But uh, on the right side, if we just throw that last uh, throw in a, in a set timeout, all of a sudden we lose our entire stack. Uh, you can see down on the bottom, I know it's pretty small, but uh, you know, it just says, uh-oh, anonymous function. What does that help? What does that tell us? How can we figure out where that happened? And this is really the, the crux of the, the tough problems uh, with async errors. So they're tough to track down because you, you lose your stack, and they're tough to catch because um, basically you are at the mercy of whatever library you're calling, right? Um, if you wanted to catch uh, an async error um, in jQuery, they'd have to try catch your callback for you. Uh, so and not, not every, every library has that kind of uh, forethought. So the, uh, the solution to async errors and trying to, trying to get stacks and figure out what's going on is obviously promises A plus. Um, how many people are familiar with promises at this point? It's kind of de facto, everybody, everybody uh, understands um, the uh, Uh, the benefits from promises. So here we have the same kind of uh, example where we're trying to find a user with ID one. So how would we catch the uh, the error here if we don't find one? Uh, pretty simple. We just set up our our two functions first the the success and the and the failure handler. So if an error throws, um, we'll catch it down in the lower function. Pretty simple, right? Um, but what catches a lot of people often is then if, even if in, in your success function, let's say the error comes back or the user comes back and we have him, but he's suspended, um, so you can't, you can't uh, get him from the API anymore. We want to throw a new error that says, you know, suspended user. Uh, it's not going to get caught um, by the error handler, which I've seen this trip up even the most seasoned uh, JavaScript developers. Um, what's, but what's worse than that is it's not even an uncaught exception in the way that you would you know, typically think of uncaught exceptions. It has, it's actually a swallowed exception because you won't see anything. Uh, there won't be anything in your console. Um, you won't even know that it happened, uh, which is kind of scary. You, know, you have to be very careful with how you handle errors and promises because it's easy to write a program that could be erroring 50% of the time, and if you don't have something there to catch it, um, you wouldn't even know because nothing shows up in your console. It's not going to bubble up to window on error or anything. Um, it's just going to swallow it. So if you wanted to catch that suspended user, you'd have to then add a second um, error handler down uh, on your next then chain. Uh, or if you have, uh, you know, the newer promise libraries, you can just call catch, and that will catch it there. So that's um, one of the biggest trip ups people get when they're uh, dealing with promises and errors. But I, I can't caution enough that every promise you write needs to have an error handler. I know it's really easy to just, when you're pro prototyping something, to just put in the success handler and be done. But like I said, uh, promise libraries will swallow your errors otherwise, and you won't even know that they're happening. And you don't, won't know where to look. And all of a sudden, you'll get bug reports from users, and you'll be like, oh, I, have, I don't have anything in my logs. Well, this is why. So <clears throat> um, next, when is the best time to throw errors? 
well, pretty much be liberal about it, throw whenever anything unexpected happens. Um, <clears throat> but that's pretty vague, right? Unexpected things happen in programs all the time. So just try and be vigilant about it. Um, for example, uh, this is pretty typical, you know, unexpected arguments. You know, if you're checking an AJAX function that needs options, if there's no options, you should throw. You shouldn't let your, your uh, program die somewhere else down the line because the, error, the errors that you throw will always be infinitely more valuable than whatever the browser generates when your program dies, you know, five functions later. Um, also, unexpected code paths. So if there's part of your program that you know should never execute, make sure you throw an error there, right? Um, you know, for example, if, there, if you never want this switch statement to not match a value, throw an error at, on the default case. Uh, wrong number of arguments as well is another uh, uh, perfect example. And you'll see this a lot in, in uh, frameworks like you know, Ember and Angular will, are always adding assertions in, so much so that uh, Ember has a, in their production build, they strip out all their assertions because if they didn't, it would actually add uh, file size to the library, which if, if you've worked with Ember uh, at all recently in the you know, last 1.6 or 1.7 versions, um, you'll notice that their error, message, their error messages are great. You can figure out what's going wrong with your program pretty quick just by what the, uh, the library throws at you. Um, but this can be kind of simplified in do down into uh, runtime assertions. So uh, they're not super complex. You just create a, a function that throws if a test fails and you pass it in a message. Um, so if we go back to our, our AJAX function that expects an object of options, um, we can easily just uh, use an assertion function says, saying if the op options aren't an object, throw this message. Um, similarly, with runtime assert, with um, a swap function, it's pretty simple um, to just swap in runtime assertions, and they're they're almost like inline unit tests, right? Um, you want to test that the things that are happening in your program are what you expect, and I don't, I don't want to encourage you to not write any tests at all. They're not a replacement for unit tests. They're just something you should do in, in addition, and they're they're also something you should test. Um, you should set up a, a test to make sure that this throws an error when you expect it to throw an error. Um, unit tests are great for everything before you deploy. But after you deploy, if things start going wrong, how will you know? Uh, and that's where your custom written error messages will come in. Um, and just some additional reading here, the Mozilla De Developer Network uh, error page, if you just Google that, has a ton of stuff. Um, also, if you're doing any node stuff, uh, you, you should really check out the V8 Stack Trace API. Um, it has the uh, support for um, changing the stack trace limit, which is set usually at 10. You, you get 10 lines of functions that are called. Um, but you can set that to infinity, or you can set it to you know, 100 if you uh, have, a, have a long stack trace you can't figure out. And they also have, they have a whole API about uh, dealing with errors. They ha actually have this capture stack trace tree function that you can override where uh, when an error is thrown, you get the raw output of the stack trace ahead of time and you can like manipulate it, you know, strip out maybe, uh, let's say, for example, you ha you're uh, writing an Ember app and um, whenever Ember throws an error, all you see is like a million Ember calls and then one call in, in, in your actual program, which is the root of the problem. Um, you could implement, you know, capture stack tree, uh, grab the stack, strip out all the Ember calls, and then just leave your one uh, program call. You know, basically strip out all the libraries that that aren't um, actually writing, aren't the actual code that you wrote, and give you a better idea and help you identify stuff uh, more quickly. Um, and that's about all I had. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise. Uh, reach out to me. Here's my email. I'm on Twitter. 
Um, you can check out some goofy vines that I do on the web if you want as well. And people still use IRC, so hop on IRC once in a while and say hi. And that's Any, it. Anybody have any questions? Oh, we have one. Uh, less a question and more just an observation. Uh, when you have an asynchronous uncaught error like you had shown on one of your slides, mm -hmm. uh, this is Chrome specific, but you can actually uh, enable pausing on uncaught exceptions and actually turn on async stack tracing, which makes it a little easier. It's still, your solution's obviously much better, but that is just a thing you can do if somehow you didn't implement or somebody didn't properly catch all the things correctly. That's one way that you can dig back through asynchronously. Uh, and it works pretty well. Interesting. Great. OK. Adam. <laughs> I just thought I'd piggy piggyback off of that. But I think that even for like um, when you're passing anonymous functions around, it would be a good idea to always name even your anonymous functions because the name of your function will show up in your console log errors as well. And that can easily be a quick hitter like, oh, if you're naming your functions right, you can quickly find what you need to do. These are great debugging tips. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else? Yeah, I just figured I would add a live demo uh, to your talk. Okay. So, as you can all see, throwing strings doesn't work. 